two o'clock, so we will get started. This is accessibility and disability in special collections. We have Zachary Tumlin, who is the project archivist for the Economic Papers Archive at the Rubenstein Library at Duke University. Um, and so I'll have Zachary take it away and share um, on this topic. All right, thank you, Devin. Here's our agenda today. We'll start off with this introduction and then we'll get into the meat of the webinar, starting with physical accessibility, then moving to digital accessibility and ending with describing disability, which will be the majority of this session. The photo on the screen is of Duke University Chapel, and in the foreground, we can see a wheelchair user being pushed away from the chapel down a ramp. And I'm actually no longer working with the Economist Papers Archive. Instead, I'm surveying and processing the Siemens family papers, and I found this print in an unprocessed edition just recently, and I thought that it would be perfect for today. So as Devin said, I am a project archivist at Duke University. And I'm also a disabled accessibility specialist who focuses on inclusive employment. Before coming to Duke, I worked at the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the National Agricultural Library, and the University of Maryland. And in my past life, I was a former middle school band director my MLIS is in Archives and Digital Curation from the University of Maryland, and I also hold a Bachelor of Music in Music Education from West Virginia University. And now we have uh, two polls that we would like to start here. I'll launch those now. Uh, Zachary, your screen stopped sharing. I don't know if that was... Yeah, I noticed I that. that. Let's see. So folks, the first poll is, is your degree of specialization in archives? There we go, awesome. I'll just give a few more seconds for that poll. All right, so it's 70 30 split, 70 no, 30 yes. Oh, this is one us. of the reasons we're focusing on description today in this webinar. Mm -hmm. The second question we have is Do you currently have archival duties in your job? Right, and for this poll, swung in the other direction, more of a 60-40 split, 60% 60 saying yes, you currently have archival duties in your job, and 37% saying no. All right. Yes. All right. Now, on to our goals for today. Our primary goal is to learn more about how best to describe disability. Our secondary goal is to increase our knowledge around best practices in physical and digital accessibility. And our th third goal or point that I would like to emphasize during the course of today is that systemic inaccessibility issues require advocacy and coalition building to address, especially when they deal with the built environment we can't take 
a sledgehammer or a jackhammer to a building and make it more accessible. Examples like that really require multiple people to work together to increase accessibility. Out of scope for today is a focus on instruction, exhibitions, electronic resource licensing, and general library experiences. And partially why it's out of scope for today is because TR TRLN or uh, NC Live has already had webinars on these topics. So instead, we are going to be focusing on other things today. Two quotes that I would like to share before we get started comes from this paper that we'll dive more into later. But I want us to think about not just of disabled people as users of archives and disabled people in records, but also disabled staff members. So our first quote concerns disabled users and staff. Access to archives shapes or denies disabled people's experiences of our own histories. And the second quote concerns disabled people in records. The feelings of longing, excitement, sadness, and loss that occur when I search for disabled people in archives. I wanted to share both of these quotes because I know what it is like to experience those feelings when I search for disabled people in archives. And I consider this history the history of my community. Physical accessibility. We're going to start by looking at public spaces, uh, specifically buildings. And I'm mostly going to be asking you a series of questions, kind of like if we were doing an accessibility audit. And this is to get you in the mindset of accessibility and the questions that I ask myself when I see these spaces or when I deal with these topics. So concerning the building itself, how easy is it to locate the building and navigate to it using different forms of transportation and locomotion? This means considering public transit options, parking, walkways and sidewalks, signage, and construction. Concerning public transit options, this might mean a drop-off points. Parking might mean accessible parking spaces and who to contact if you have a question about parking. Um, possibly if someone needs towed from an accessible parking space, for example, or just general uh, parking questions, it can be good to have somebody to call. Walkways and sidewalks might mean the condition of them. Is there any cracked pavement or cement that somebody could trip on or that would impede the movement of a wheelchair? Are there any sta stairs that would make these paths not usable for a wheelchair user? Signage, this can be the clarity of the signage. We generally don't want too many words, uh, but also our permanent signage having a braille, um, especially indoors. But I will say that librarians and archivists can like to think that signage will solve everything, and that is not always the case. Uh, more signs are not always the answer. Lastly, construction is a big one, especially for those of us on maybe larger university campuses where it seems like the construction never ever fully stops. And a big thing with construction is that it can be constantly evolving. And it shouldn't be your responsibility to monitor this, but ideally there is someone at the university who is and is thinking of physical accessibility and so being aware of how this might affect getting to your building. Next, how easy is it to enter, exit, and move about the bu building using different mobility aids? This means considering stairs, 
elevators, doorways, the doors themselves, and bathrooms. Concerning stairs, for example, at Duke, in the reading room, we might bring people down into the basement in the instance of a tornado warning. But what, happen, what would happen if you then couldn't use the elevator to get back up, or maybe in the case of a fire, and this is where there is a thing called an evacuation chair, that is able to climb stairs um, to help get people out rather than relying on people to physically carry somebody upstairs. Elevators, there may be an elevator, but is that the only one? And then what happens if that elevator is not working? Um, elevators being in good working condition can be an issue. Doorways, uh, this means the width of the doorways. Um, ideally, uh, 36 inches, I believe, is, is what we'd ideally like to see. The doors themselves, how heavy is the door if it requires manually opening? Um, some doors, especially fire doors, can be heavier than others. Um, are any of these doors automatic? Ideally, the main door into our building would be, and possibly other doors after that. And then bathrooms. I actually know an individual who now works in the federal government who when he was at university with me, he was most passionate about the accessibility of bathrooms and it's a real issue. And so how accessible are the bathrooms in your building, especially that, um, a user might use, but then also thinking of staff. Hopefully there's not like a double standard there of bathrooms. And then I'll also mention uh, maps and floor plans. I really like maps and floor plans to be available online that I can look at before I go. Um, but also are they posted in the building anywhere? Um, just helping people uh, get around the space who may be unfamiliar to it. Next, uh, we're in the building and now we are in the reading room. Can desks, tables, and lockers accommodate a wheelchair user? This is when you will see a split level reference or circulation desks. That way if somebody is seated, you can also be seated and interact at the same height uh, rather than talking down to them literally, physically, or um, the view being blocked. And at least one height adjustable table in the reading room is ideal. Um, I know that height adjustable desks have become more common for our homes and offices but having at least one height adjustable table in the reading room is also great. Are chairs easy to move out and do they accommodate different bodies? Ideally, your chairs have wheels so that they're easy to move and then they don't have arms. How accessible are any public computers and reproduction equipment? For example, do the computers have any accessible software installed. We'll get into that more later. Is the keyboard a high contrast large print keyboard? And what is the height of all this equipment in the room? How flexible is the lighting? Is the only lighting available hardwired into the ceiling slash walls? This is something we deal with at Duke where not every table in the reading room has a light above it, but each table does have a lamp on it. So even though the hardwired lighting is not ideal, a secondary solution has come up with, so at least somebody can manipulate the lighting at their table, even if it may not be ideal. 
Some people still prefer to be at the tables that are directly under a light. Magnification. Uh, what magnification tools are available? In this day and age, a magnifying glass is inadequate. And so I'd like to share this photo of a um, I'm kind of blanking on the name at the moment. It's essentially a document camera with a screen. Many of us are more familiar with document cameras, especially for our users, but they typically require a connection to a laptop that they've brought. What if they don't have that? What if they just want a simpler solution? And so uh, this video magnifier here allows you to place something under the camera and then the screen displays it. So I don't know that I've ever seen one in a, a reading room, but I have seen one in accessible library spaces. And I think that we could bring it over into the archive and use it for our purposes as well. Now, I know I said we weren't going to focus on exhibits, but just some things I'll mention here in brief. How tall are the cases and what height from the floor are captions installed? Are the captions available in large print, either physically or digitally? Is there a QR code, for example, that I can scan and bring them up on my phone or has a large print copy been made and hung somewhere around the exhibit that I can grab if I need large print captions? Is there a way to experience the exhibit without sight, perhaps through audio description available online? I've seen different versions of this, um, but even if it's something like your narrating the exhibit for me and describing what you're looking at and reading the captions that is a solution and so is there any other way to experience the exhibit except with sight multimedia exhibits are great but how accessible is the audio and video has the audio been transcribed and the video captioned I'm a big proponent of incorporating multimedia into our exhibits, but they still need to be accessible too. We don't want to forget about them. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is something that I've run across in this collection that I'm surveying and processing, where there is an example of a museum gallery for the blind. And so all of the pieces in this gallery a blind user can touch. Obviously, that's hard to do in the archive, but it did make me think about when designing an exhibit, is there any way to let users physically interact with facsimiles or 3D objects? Maybe not in a public exhibit, but what about in an instruction session? It just made me think. Now, moving to staff only spaces, starting with the stacks. How low and high is the shelving, meaning how low and high do you have to reach? And how wide are the aisles? And so here is a diagram that I actually found on the Space Saver website. They are a company that installs mobile storage units. And they actually have this page on ADA compliance. So what you're seeing is a wheelchair and having enough space for the wheelchair to make a complete 360 degree turn because of this 60 inch aisle. Uh, is it easy to access and move step stools, ladders, and carts? And are they stable? I actually had an archival interview that required a physical fitness test of 
climbing a ladder up and down and the ladder was not the most stable ladder I've ever been on. And I was seemingly more concerned about this than the interviewer was. So do we have this equipment? Is it in good working or order? Is it easy to move around? Because there's no way that our shelving can all be at the height for a wheelchair user to easily access. But when we need to get up higher, is, is there a safe way to do that? Hopefully there is. Next, processing and office spaces. While processing spaces typically have uh, to use an open floor plan, how possible is it to make office spaces into a closed floor plan? Um, yeah. If it's a cubicle or an actual room with a door, how close to that can we get for our uh, workstations? What is the awareness level of ergonomics? This covers the tables that we work at, the chairs that we sit in, the computers that we use. I'm fortunate to work at a place that has a hospital attached and there's actually like an employee health and safety unit and there's an ergonomics division. And so for example, they have a recommended list of chairs. So when you're buying a new office chair, they've already got a list to pick from. Um, there's even a place you can go and try them out. But yeah, what is our awareness level of ergonomics and how well are we doing that? Especially when we talk about libraries and archives, the prevalence of repetitive motion injuries is what we're trying to avoid. Again, how flexible is the lighting, but also what type of lighting is installed? We generally try to avoid fluorescent lighting so this might mean LED lighting these days. Is it dimmable, for example, if we're talking about kind of more like office lighting? But how flexible is the lighting? Is there only one temperature control? How well does air circulate? And do any vents blow directly onto anyone? For the most part, there's only one temperature control in these spaces that we're talking about. Ideally, it would be, there would be multiple zones of temperature that we could control. Uh, but we know from COVID that air circulation uh, is something that we maybe haven't always thought about as much as, as we should. Um, but we do know when we go out like to a restaurant, we're standing under uh, cold air vent that's blowing onto us. We do notice that. Is the workplace fragrance free? I feel like that should just be the standard now. Um, obviously, we don't have like open flames in the archive, hopefully, uh, but like no essential oils. Is there dedicated space to take phone or video calls, especially of a private nature? And is it soundproof? Um, do you have like a phone closet, whether that's a space that you've designated as such, or they do make ones that you can buy now. Uh, one of the employers I've worked at had one, I believe they got it as some kind of test, um, but it ended up being permanent. And I ended up seeing it actually in a TV show recently. It was used um, to record music but I recognized it because I had already seen it before and I had been inside of it. And so it was pretty much a soundproof space that you could go and take a job interview, for example. Or I'm also thinking of with disabled people like uh, telehealth or phone calls of maybe a medical nature, for example, is we don't want them to have to go too far to do things like that. Ideally, we would like to be able to accommodate them. And the link in the upper right is the job accommodation network. I always like to mention this when I do these kinds of sessions, 
because often the question is, I'm recently diagnosed. I don't know what kind of accommodations I might like to request at my job. You can go there and it'll tell you. On the other side, if you're the employer and an employee is disclosed to you, but maybe they don't know what to request, you can go here and see what are the, the common things, what are the common accommodations with different um, disabilities. So I always like to mention the Job Accommodation Network. Digital accessibility. I think I need to speed up a little bit here. Insert links into alt text. Don't copy and paste a link. Screen readers typically don't handle that very well. And the text should describe the content being linked to like you're seeing on the screen. It doesn't say click here, for example. It describes what the link is associated with. We could do a whole webinar, and I have just on alt text, but alt text needs to be added to non-decorative uh, images. Sometimes there are decorative images that we don't have to worry about, and we can mark them as such. But when we uh, use non-decorative images, we need to add alt text. Do not rely on color alone to differentiate text and make sure contrast is sufficient. Um, there are color contrast checkers and that's what is linked to here, uh, but we also don't wanna rely on color alone. Uh, we wanna use sans serif fonts, which is what I'm using here today. Use headings and lists to provide structure. Um, this is where we talk about H1, H2, maybe if you've had programming experience, you've heard of headings and also coding lists to be lists. Um, but we want to give our document um, structure to make it more easy to navigate. And it also can look better uh, as well. Tables should only hold data and have a header row. Tables should not be used for formatting. They should only be used for data. And there's usually like a checkbox in Excel you can mark to indicate that there is a header row. Yeah. Forms should have fillable fields. This is a pet peeve of mine. I don't wanna get on the soapbox here, but when you have a document that is a form, rather than having like, uh, an underlined portion or an underscored portion where somebody is supposed to print out the document and then manually write in or remove the underscore and then type in, no. Fillable fields, you can add fillable fields. The link here is, a, I believe it is a Microsoft Word help article, but especially when it's like forms related to interviews or annual reviews, especially those forms should have fillable fields. Please, if I could get you to do one thing today, <laughs> it would be for your forms to have fillable fields. We already kind of mentioned about transcribing audio and captioning video. Again, I, we could do a whole webinar on this. Um, it's getting easier to do. I know some of you probably have questions about this. Um, there are resources out there, but yeah, unfortunately we can't spend all, all day on that. Um, provide documents in multiple file types. I mentioned accessible PDFs because sometimes we only provide a PDF and that can be a problem because the PDF is then inaccessible because we haven't checked the accessibility of the original document, like if it's a Word document, for example. And so make sure that your source document is accessible before you make it into a PDF, but then maybe also just provide both. Lastly, turn on or run built-in accessibility checkers like Accessibility Checker in Microsoft Office products. This screenshot here is of the PowerPoint options. This is the Accessibility tab. And I know that the font is small, 
but the first checkbox there is for keep accessibility checker running while I work. And then when you do that, along the bottom bar, it is just running there and it will tell you when there are accessibility issues so that you don't have to run the accessibility checker just like if you can remember you used to have to run spell check it wasn't always running so microsoft has been trying to make accessibility checkers like that take the next step i did want to mention accessibility assistant is the next step that microsoft has indicated and this is where instead of just alerting you to issues and maybe trying to help you it will take a more active role and try to suggest how to fix the problems if you're not too well versed in all of these things. I've got a series of links here that I wanted to share. We can get the slide deck to you afterwards so that you can have access to all of these links. Section 508 was added to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 in 1998 and it governs information and communication technology used by the federal government. I mentioned that today, even though most of us aren't in the federal government, because the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT, is a document that explains how tech products comply with Section 508. So for example, especially when it comes to electronic resources, a lot of these vendors already have VPATs that you can request to see how accessible the electronic resource is. The web content accessibility guidelines are maintained by the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, version 2.2 was just released on the 5th of October, and version 3 is in development. These are essentially the guidelines for web content. The Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool is a suite of evaluation tools that identify errors occur according to WCAG. The Library Accessibility Alliance facilitates accessibility audits of electronic resources and creates material to advocate for accessibility. They've already looked at many electronic resources, and so you can already go there and see about electronic resources that you might use in your library and how accessible or not they are. But we always have to keep in mind that that is a snapshot in time. We know that electronic resources evolve. Hopefully they become more accessible. I wanted to mention the Triangle Research, Research Library Network Guide to Negotiating Accessibility in Electronic Resource Licenses. Because Duke is a member of TRLN, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this document. Windows has a built-in screen reader called Windows Narrator that many people aren't aware of. The most popular screen reader is probably JAWS, which can also come packaged with the screen magnifier Zoom Text in a product called Fusion. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with a screen reader, uh, Windows Narrator allows you to easily experience what using a screen reader is like, which I think is a really valuable experience. Windows has built in speech to text capability using Windows speech recognition. The most popular speech recognition software is probably Dragon, though. Morphic is a line of software that seeks to surface accessibility options in operating systems and lets users transfer their settings between devices. So for example, there's an enterprise option that can be used on all of the public machines at a university. Um, when someone logs in, they can bring their accessibility settings with them rather than have to start from scratch. Lastly, your employer might already have a unit or person dedicated to this subject of digital accessibility, especially for compliance of public facing websites. For example, at Duke, uh, we do have uh, such a person and he is responsible for all of the public facing web pages. So he's not responsible for the internal only ones, but he is responsible for the public facing ones 
So for example, the public facing library web pages. All right, now on to the meat of today's session, describing disability. Crip time and anticipatory erasure. Disabled people encounter misrepresentation and partial or missing representation of disability in archival records. Records, when they exist, which is a key point, they don't always exist, can record or perpetuate harm from stereotypes to murder. And record creators tend to be non-disabled people who held power over disabled people. Disabled archival users experience this past violence in the present, and they can have an emotional response even when they are mentally prepared. So they learn to expect this erasure. This is what we mean by anticipatory erasure. And this especially happens to people with additional intersecting identities. Models of disability. So how might we encounter disability portrayed in the archive? We might see things using the religious or moral model. And in this case, you will see disability portrayed as the result of sin, either the person themselves or their parent. It can also be the result of amorality. The charity model of disability portrays disability as a tragedy and that we should pity disabled people. The medical model portrays disability as a pathological condition defined by deficit or deviance. It is the individual burden of one person and we should seek to cure disability, segregate these disabled people, or exterminate them, kill them in some extreme cases. Coming off of this medical model, we have the rehabilitation model. And the goal with rehabilitation typically is to make the disabled person as normal as possible, as whole as possible. They need to accommodate themselves into society. Society doesn't need to change at all. This leads us to the social model of disability, which instead emphasizes inaccessible buildings or the built environment. Um, discriminatory attitudes and ideological systems that attribute normalcy and deviance to particular minds and bodies. Coming off of the social model, we have the political slash relational model, which I'm still learning more about. And this is connected to systems of power, and it points out that disability always exists in relation to ability and that we see disability shift across time, place, and interactions, as well as with te technology, architecture, and objects. What we think of as disability changes over time. Now, getting back to crit provenance, and this is where we're getting into some more theory here. Um, try to stay with me here. Uh, we'll just, we'll try not to spend too much time with this, but I did want to mention a little bit of archival theory here. Evoking disability studies scholarship that centers the relationships created through and because of disability in relation to other disabled people and histories through activism and intersectional identities, materials through technology and assistive devices, attitudes through discrimination and advocacy, places and spaces through built environments, accessibility and place, and power through the inter-informed connections of ableism to other forms of oppression, a crip provenance reorients 
established notions of provenance. Instead of focusing strictly on the former, often fictitious, whole fonds, it emphasizes the relations created specifically because records are incomplete, dispersed, unknown, and rearranged. So all that I'd like to point out here is that when I am looking at disability in the archival record, I'm noticing histories, materials, attitudes, places and spaces, and power. So when I'm doing my description, I'm thinking of how to describe these things that I'm seeing. A few other quotes that I wanted to pull from um, this paper. How can we tell a history of disability when there is little or no archival evidence or when the evidence that is presented is harmful, violent, or incomplete? People, organizations, and bodies produce, select, describe, organize, and access records, a constellation of decision-making that impacts and shapes history. As archivists or people that work with archival records, it's important to recognize our agency in this. We make a certain amount of decisions. Minimal description could produce what Tanya Sutherland describes as places of oblivion that ignore, erase, or silence certain perspectives. I'm about to show you a case study next that, inter um, that illustrates this. And we're trying not to provide too much description because we don't have the space and time, but we also want to provide enough that we're avoiding created, creating these places of oblivion. Ableism is intertwined with heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, and capitalism because each system is constructed upon the creation of an ideal body mind built upon the exclusion and elimination of a subjugated other from whom profits and status are extracted. I'd like to point out capitalism, especially with its emphasis on productivity. This is where a lot of disability stigma comes from when you're not able to be as productive as a non-disabled person. The goal is to reclaim our stories, to tell our truths in the face of a plethora of records that might claim our inferiority, spectacle, or lack of existence in history. So that is my goal today, is to teach you how to do some of this reclaiming whether you're disabled or not, um, to help tell these stories. I'd like to mention this guide to conscious editing at Wilson Special Collections Library at the University of North Carolina. There is a section on disability, which I was glad to see, concerning outdated historical and offensive language. What can we do about it? We should retain the names of organizations and folder titles. We don't want to change them to make them more maybe appropriate for today. We want to retain them because like that is the name of an organization, for example. But we can update ableist language um, in less quoting, for example, when we're describing these folders, for example, we don't have to use the same maybe offensive language in our description. Contextualize when necessary. For example, if the name of an organization has changed over time, possibly to become less offensive, we can give context to that. Consult self-advocate-led organizations for current terminology and style guides. I always mention this National Center on Disability and Journalism has a style guide. It's also something you're seeing from news organizations uh, more often. and pointing out this self-advocate-led organizations, not 
organizations are not always led by self-advocates. Sometimes they're just led by advocates. Many of us are familiar with person-first language. We may be less familiar with identity-first language. So person-first meaning a person with a disability versus a disabled person. What is the purpose of person-first? It came about around the time of the disability rights movement, around 1990, um, the passage of the ADA. But there are some communities today like the deaf community, like the autistic community that prefer identity first language. So you should be aware of that. And if possible, it's great if you can ask someone for their preferred language, like a living donor, for example, and respecting what their choice is, even if you have a different choice that you would make respecting what their choice is. All right, now let's look at applying these things to a case study. And we're gonna focus on the Human Betterment League of North Carolina. The records of this organization are held by the University of North Carolina. In looking at these, I noticed that some Durham residents, Duke being in Durham, as well as some Duke Medical Center doctors appear on rosters of the board of directors. So me being a Duke employee, I searched the Duke University Library catalog for these people, and I came across one of them, Herbert Clarence Bradshaw. And in his collection, there is a file for the Human Betterment League. But Originally, it was not described further. There was no additional detail besides the folder title. And there was no mention of his involvement in the bio note. So if I hadn't started with the Human Betterment League records, I would not have gotten to these records organically in the Duke catalog. Um, how could we briefly describe a folder contents and his involvement? So I'm going to show you some items from this folder. I will warn that some of them are more upsetting than others. I will say the majority of the items in the folder were routine correspondence around event planning, nothing extremely exciting. So I'm showing you the highlights. I'm not showing you the entire folder. Um, but as I'm showing you these things, I want you to be thinking about how you might describe them. Um, and then we'll also focus on how we would describe his involvement in the organization. Here is a quotation from the Constitution of the Human Betterment League. Their purpose and objectives, number three. Since no child can be brought up satisfactorily by a mentally ill or mentally defective parent, the League will devote a part of its efforts to the solution of this important problem. Next, we have a memo from 1967 from the treasurer of the Human Betterment League. Prevention of births of mentally defective children seem vital to the welfare of future generations. Even if normal children born of mentally defective parents have very little chance to live normal lives. Let me reread that. Even if normal children born of mentally defective parents have very little chance to live normal lives. The league's main purpose is to support measures which will prevent these handicaps. Education of the public in this field is one of the principal objectives. Here we have two newsletters. The first one explaining what the league is and what it does. And it's talking about the history of the org to start with. Mr. Milner was a philanthropist who approached the subject from his deep interest in child welfare. And his thinking was very far in advance of his time. The archivists in the room know that this kind of laudatory language is not something that we use anymore when we're describing records. So 
it can be a red flag. Next, we have the physician looks at sterilization. We'll notice that the physician is already a member of the board of directors of the league, so he's not impartial. As a consequence, she becomes frigid. Her husband may seek his pleasures elsewhere, and the family unit then faces the possibility of dissolution. We know frigidity is a problematic term. Again, it's another red flag. Whenever we see that, that should uh, pick our attention here and, and take a closer look. This is from the 20th anniversary celebration of the League in 1967. This article was printed in the program. It's called An Idea Come of Age. The problem of quality results from the fact that the least fit are doing the most breeding. In international terms, it is the so-called developing nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America which have the highest birth rates. In terms of individuals, the quality problem results from the fact that birth rate is the highest among those least qualified for parenthood, the mentally, physically, genetically, and for those reasons, the economically scrub stock. This is from a proposal to create the North Carolina Commission on Population and Family in 1967. The first section that I've highlighted says, those parents who are concerned about minimizing hereditary disease and maximizing the genetic endowment of their children as yet lack a ready source of scientific and ethical advice. The first goal of the commission being to improve the cultural and genetic quality of the population of the state. Here we have an educational film prepared under the sponsorship of the Human Betterment League in 1971 called Windsong. And we notice a term here called family planning. So rather than sterilization, we've moved on to family planning. And what does that mean? Here's the 20th anniversary celebration of the league in 1972. This article was in the program called, and it's called Our Seed Sprouted. And the league looked upon implement implementation of the sterilization law of the state as one of its objectives. A civic organization was badly needed to tell the people of North Carolina that something must be done to improve the quality of the state's human resources, and so the Human Betterment League of North Carolina was born. Here we have a 1972 letter from a uh, Dr. Benjamin, and He's listed the subject of this letter as optional euthanasia for hopelessly defective infants. And he was sending this to three people, including Mr. Bradshaw. And the last item here is from a seminar on genetic counseling in 1974. You'll notice it was funded by a grant from the National Foundation March of Dimes. And so we've moved on from family planning now to genetic counseling. So here is the bio note for Herbert Bradshaw. And originally, like I said, it omitted mention of his involvement in the Human Betterment League. So I added on to the opening paragraph here Bradshaw's papers detail his involvement as a member of the Board of Directors and President of the Human Betterment League of North Carolina. Here we have the scope and content, or no, I should, yeah, sorry, got it backwards. This is the scope and content note for the collection, so I'm describing the material, and then this is the bio note for Bradshaw. Um, again, I added this last sentence. Uh, he was also a member of the Board of Directors of the Human Betterment League of North Carolina, and he was president at the time of his death. I also wanted to point out the following paragraph. Um, I learned that Bradshaw was murdered, and I mention it because 
it apparently was done by an untreated um, schizophrenic. And so the fact that this disability was cropping up, I also took the time to address it here. And I felt it was important to do so in a humane way that um, even though this person, I don't think that they were the, the greatest person in the world, I think they were also dealing with some issues and I did want to treat the issue of disability with respect. Lastly, here is the folder itself and how I chose to describe it. So like I was telling you, there's mostly correspondence related to Bradshaw's interest in and service to this eugenics organization, especially around event planning. But it also, as you've seen, includes typed and printed material like newsletters and articles written by members that speaks to the organization's mission, vision, and values as their messaging changed from sterilization to family planning to genetic counseling. I wanna recognize that the University of North Carolina collection guide for the Human Betterment League records also uses similar language. Um, and I, I was glad to see that, that they pointed out how this messaging changed, but not necessarily the mission of the organization. So thank you for attending today. There is my contact information. And I also wanted to mention the Society of American Archivist Accessibility and Disability section, which I am chair of. This link will take you to our microsite. So I wanted to encourage you to contact us with any questions you might have about describing disability, for example, even if you're not a member of the Society of American Archivists, uh, this is still a group that exists to help you with questions like this. And the picture that I have is two lemurs from my most recent visit to the Duke Lemur Center. Awesome, thank you so much, Zachary. Folks, you will get the follow-up email this evening with a copy of the slides, including that link to uh, the SAA Accessibility and Disability section. I'll also include a follow-up survey, so any feedback that you have to share, future topics that you'd like to see the NC Live training program cover, um, would love to hear all those suggestions. Um, and Zachary, thanks so much for taking the time to prepare this. Um, and provide so much practical advice. Um, it seems like a lot of folks are commenting in the chat saying this was so helpful and informative. Thank you. All right, have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody.